Hello, good afternoon, everybody. So, my name is uh, Miguel Garcia Garibay. I am the Dean of Physical Sciences, and uh, my role here today is a very, very simple one. Uh, typically, I take about 15 minutes to brag about the Division of Physical Sciences, about how great our scientists are. Uh, but today, I'm going to be very short uh, because we have a, an incredible treat today. However, I will say that uh, the Department of Earth, Planetary, and Space Sciences, if you just listen to the name of the department, this really encompasses some of the most uh, interesting questions that all of us as human beings have about stuff, about the universe, about air, about planets, right? So, uh, I find that you know, the research done in the department is, uh, is uh, truly second to none. We have faculty who have uh, just the highest education to science that I've seen. Uh, some of the brightest students on campus are part of the department. Uh, and it's just a joy as a dean of physical sciences to, to be able to, to brag about it. Uh, so uh, I'm really delighted to see the audience today. I, I see some kids, I see some uh, um, parents and grandparents, and, and some students and some faculty, which is precisely the objective of these, uh, of these events to bring us together as a community and to really celebrate uh, you know, uh, everything that is great about UCLA, every, everything that is great about uh, uh, our departments, our faculty, uh, and our students. So um, you're all welcome for joining us today. I hope you, you had a, a nice reception back there. And, and I'm sure you, you, you're ready for a, an incredible treat by one of the scientists at UCLA that, that I admire the most, someone who really is a role model for me, is one of my heroes. Uh, and uh, and Jean-Luc is going to do the honor of uh, doing a proper presentation. Jean-Luc uh, Margot, the, the, the chair of the department, is here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miguel. Uh, thank you for your support of the division. Very pleased to have your support. Good evening, everyone. Um, uh, welcome to UCLA. My name is Jean-Luc Margot. I'm the chair of the Department of Earth, Planetary, and Space Sciences. And um, I'm very excited to see so many of you today for this uh, exciting event. Uh, I will be introducing today's speaker. And after a 20-minute talk or so, we will have a panel of meteorite experts. And I encourage you to write down questions for the panel. <laughs> Uh, on index cards. If you don't have index cards, raise your hand and the student volunteer will help you. Uh, and we can address these questions in the panel after the main talk. So this evening event is aligned with one aspect of our mission that we really care about, and that is education and public outreach. And I see kids in the audience, and I'm very excited that we can tickle their curiosity about science and exploration. Uh, how many of you have touched meteorites today? All right, so these are 4.6 billion year old samples that came from another world. How exciting is that? It's pretty exciting. We're also excited to first of all talk about uh, a discussion about meteorites because the mission of our department is to understand and protect our own in the universe. We're trying to understand how planets like our own form and evolve. And if you want to solve that problem, you really need to understand what's inside the planet. And that is a very, very hard problem. Uh, even on the Earth, we've only barely scratched the surface. But meteorites come from the deep interiors of meteorites and the building blocks of planets. Uh, so they are invaluable in terms of addressing these kinds of questions. And in addition to that, we get them for almost free because they just fall from the sky. <laughs> That's uh, in our department, we also study how, how life on our planet developed and whether life exists elsewhere. And in this context, meteorites also play an important role because they may have deposited organic materials or other building blocks of life on Earth. So we like to study them for that reason. Finally, meteorites and asteroids can have a big impact on life. 
just ask the dinosaurs. <laughs> so we, we want to study these bodies uh, for these reasons as well. UCLA has one of the largest collections of meteorites in the country. Um, and we're very lucky today that we can hear from the chief curator, Professor John Watson. Um, he will tell us an intriguing story about the fall of the meteorite uh, that happened more than 100 years ago. And after that, again, we'll have a conversation with our panel. Uh, we enjoy organizing events like these. If you would like to sign up to get announcements for these events, you can go to our website at epss.ucla.edu. And there's a sign-up form there. Or we also have a tablet that's circulating around the audience and you can sign up. Is the tablet somewhere? I don't see it right now. No. <laughs> we'll bring the tablet if you want to sign up for a minute. Now, before we start, uh, I would like to thank our Meteorite Advisory Board and other donors who have generously donated their time, their meteorites, or their resources to support the UCLA Meteorite Collection. Would the advisory board and our donors please stand? And now, please join me in welcoming Professor John Watson.
So this meteorite fell in Germany on a 3.30 in the afternoon. Um, Baker actually took that, the actual hour of fall, in the title of his paper. And, but the, the key aspect of this is that there were lots of people out and about. And it was a sunny day, a pleasant day in April in 1916, and so there were many, many eyewitnesses. Uh, the, the town of Trisa is in the province of Hessen, and it's only about 60 miles from Frankfurt, and about 22 miles east-northeast of Marburg. So there's Trisa over there, here's Marburg. Uh, I mentioned Marburg uh, early on because Wagner was a professor, uh, an unpaid or an untenured professor, in Marburg, and because that's where you would find the main mass of the media. Anyhow, despite favorable conditions, dry weather, few clouds in the sky, the meteorite was not found. Right away. And if you had any witnesses, as we did that day, it's fairly straightforward to know where the meteorite came down. Uh, you meteorites form fireballs, and uh, of course, how long the trajectory of the fireball is depends on the angle of approach towards the Earth. Well, this one came in at a low enough angle that, that it was observed for a hundred miles or so in all the, well, in, in the direction of it was falling. And if, if at the, after the fall you have the witnesses point in the direction that it stopped glowing, they more or less fall straight down after they stop blowing. They, they, they're incandescent early on because they come in at a velocity of about 20 kilometers per second on average. But by the time atmospheric drag has slowed them down to about 1 kilometer per second velocity, they, they're not being heated enough by the friction of the air molecules hitting the surface and they stop blowing. And, and in, in the meantime, they're in the dense part of the atmosphere, which means the drag is even greater than they tend to do a good approximation of this sort of straight line. So uh, in this diagram here, uh, these are observers, and they're, the arrows show the, the direction they pointed when asked where they observed the meteorite to stop going. So the, the relatively young scientist, Alfred Baker, uh, was, uh, had the title in German of Privatdozent at the University of Marburg. And he, the, the Great War was in progress at this time, and, and he was a captain in, I suppose, the army, but he, he was trained as a meteorologist. He had, he had two majors in his PhD, meteorology and astronomy. And, and you can see how, how this combination of majors would, the astronomy part of this major would lead him to be interested in meteorites. Which I, I didn't know about until a couple of years ago when, when I was asked for my data. I'll tell you more about that. So anyhow, he was, in, he was wounded. Uh, he uh, was allowed to come back to Marburg. And this was after the fireball had been seen. But he went out with very visual observations. He uh, uh, discovered, I mean, he, he located, based on the visual observations, where it had stopped going someplace in here. He, he made the, the projected path below a, a curve because he, as a meteorologist, checked to see what the winds aloft were like. And he corrected for uh, the fact that the wind could cause a deflection in this case, to the east, uh, as it was coming down. So we put this X there, but then when one, uh, oh, and he also did a harder job, and that is he tried to figure out how, how high it was above the Earth when it stopped blowing. And it was rather low, 16 kilometers. Some stopped blowing already at, at 30 kilometers, and I would say the typical one stops blowing at 25. Um, this, this X was in a field and there was no meter out there. But, but of course, there's an uncertainty of the order of a telemeter in, uh, in the location of, of uh, his, his estimated location for the 
Um, so, when, when it was not found, Dinger and, and others decided, well, uh, we'll find it when, when the farmers cut the grain. But then they did harvest the grain in October or so, but they still didn't find the deer, right? And so then they thought it, thought it again, and they said, well, it must have fallen in the woods. And the, there were many scientists interested in the, this very bright fireball, especially in Marburg, and they, so they used their money, their own money, and their connections to get notes that just put in, new, in uh, newspapers, and, and, uh, they, and they contacted chief foresters to tell them that a meteorite may have fallen in the woods and to get some information. And sure enough, uh, one of the foresters reported seeing a, a new pit in the woods. It is part of the forest that he was in charge of. But by the time he reported this, that spot was covered with snow. So, so it fell in, in 1916, and now in the spring, when the snow melted in 1917, it went out and he showed it to the pit. They dug that uh, they have the 1.6 meters. That's, that's pretty deep. It, it was coming out pretty fast, so at that point, they found a 63 kilogram iron meteorite. And as he had predicted, because it was only 16 millimeters above the earth where it stopped going, it was an iron meteorite. And the one that you saw on top of it. Turns out, it's a member of the largest group of iron meteorites, but one of the most anomalous memories of that large group of iron meteorites. So they, the Marburg Society of, for Natural History raised enough money to purchase the meteorite, and uh, Baker published this monograph that is shown there on the cover. And in 2015, a, a German colleague uh, contacted him and said, I, I know you've studied TRISA by using your technique of neutron activation. And could I get your data from you? Because we're having a special meeting to uh, celebrate the 100th anniversary of the fall of TRISA. And I, I uh, gave him my data. I, I always give people the data that they asked for. And um, when I re-examined the, in the crisis relationships to other members of the group 3AD, uh, I realized that it, I thought I could do a better interpretation than had been done in the past. And so I rushed my publication through and got it published exactly a uh, hundred years. <laughs> and and uh, uh, I, you may not know, but at least in, in, uh, in fields of natural history, such as meteorite research, but, but in general, in geology too, you're always sort of proud if you can get the cover image. And so there we got the cover image. And in fact, the Marburg, the people in Marburg, uh, I, I wanted a good picture of the meteorite, and they didn't get a good picture of the meteorite, and they did the montage of, of this with the meteorite in this very nice way. And they sent me a, a reprint version. Uh, I mean, it's, so it's not the original. The original is long since out of print. But I, but I have the exactly, I mean, it's a true, true copy, and it had been reprinted. 20 years ago or so, but they were still conserving some copies in the department. So, and I, I told you already, it's, it's preserved today in the, the museum at the University of Harvard. So, uh, now the, the remainder of my uh, 20 minutes is uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my research and then a little bit about, about Alfred Baker. And especially, uh, I mean, for some of you, I'll tell you maybe for the first time what Alfred Baker has done. And then uh, for others of you, I, I'm, I feel quite sure I'm going to be telling you some facts about Baker and Baker. So here's what my, some of my neutron activation data looks like. What we have here is the plot of iridium. 
versus gold, and these are long, long diagrams. So it's a factor of 2,000 from here to here. And the way you can achieve such high levels of fractionation is by fractional crystallization, which involves you, uh, an element partitions between the solid and the liquid, and then the liquid totally remixes, and then you do it again. And you just keep doing it again. On Earth, we have uh, melts of silicate rocks that, are, that also are undergoing fractional crystallization, but we never see factors of 2,000. Uh, like this, and the simple reason is that you keep changing the phase that it's precipitating. And every time you go from olivine to planetary clays to, to, to pyroxene or, or whatever, the, the partition coefficients change. But here, it's one phase of iron called gamma iron that's precipitating the whole time. But uh, the two curves here are the calculated trajectory of the solid that's forming and the, the liquid that's evolving, of course, at the same time. And so after 0% crystallization, so in the very beginning, you're here and here, and after 30% crystallization, these crosses show you where you are. And it, it turns out that a big BRI called Cape York, which many samples are produced in the American Museum in New York City, uh, and it is Greenland, but it was originally found in Greenland, spreads out all the way across the diagram. And I published an important paper in 99 where I said this, this looks like equilibrium mixing between the liquid over here and the solid over here. So these cave work irons are about 50 50, and these are largely true solids. And uh, here, so there I only show the 30% curve, here I show a bunch of other curves, but, but uh, I had neglected, in fact, when I showed you, well, I won't come back, when I, when I showed you the first slide with Trisa on it, to point out that Trisa, which is right there, plots over on the right side and cannot be explained by equilibrium. Equilibrium mixing only allows you to go between the red curve and the blue curve. But, but there it is, sitting over there. And how do you get there? Well, the, uh, this is not a new contribution of mine. It's been, the idea has been around a long time. But you can mix the solid from up here with a liquid down here. And so you might imagine, say, a uh, um, magma chamber with something falling off the roof of the magma chamber, settling through the magma, coming down to the bottom. But this occurred long after the solid had formed up in the ceiling of, the, of this region that the melt was in. Anyhow, that, if I mix 3% with 45%, I can explain these guys just marginally. And if I mix 3% with 80% crystallized, the curve actually goes off, off the uh, edge of the diagram, but I can explain everything, some other things. And then my last slide of my own stuff is much, much more complicated, but it's an interesting part of the story. All these blue points are palisites. Palisites are the meteorites that consist roughly half of olivine, and, and, which is a silicate, and metal. And they, they are thought to form at the core metal interface in that asteroid. And the a uh, picture on the upper right is one I borrowed from a set of photos that I had from Arlene Schlazer, who, who was uh, standing a few minutes ago as, as one of our donors. So uh, the conclusion that I reached is uh, Trisa and Delegate and these others, I call them the Trisa Quintet, are, are very closely related to the process. Okay, on to... Alfred Wegener. I don't find this a very becoming picture of Alfred. But, uh, anyhow, Alfred uh, is, is famous because of this monograph, the Entstehung der Quantivita und And the translation of that is the formation of continents and oceans. And what it mainly is talking about is continental drift. And he was stimulated by the story that 
even those of you who don't know about Baker have long since heard, which is that the outline of the west coast of Africa seems to fit like a jigsaw puzzle with the outline of the east coast of South America. And, and, but what Baker did is he was the first to assemble all the evidence that he could find that bore on this subject and, and make the claim this, this really works, it, it really has to be. I mean, evidence like we find fossils in Africa that are just like fossils in South America, we find kinds of rocks in, in Africa that are just like the rocks on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, and the case was really a strong one, uh, but, but uh, he was largely started in his lifetime. My, my father-in-law wrote me when I'd been married to Gudrun two or three years and said, you know, this guy, people talk a lot about this guy, Gagner. What, what is the opinion in the, in the U.S.? And I'd just been to the... Washington meeting of the Geophysical American Geophysical Union, and I wrote him back and said, uh, people were talking about this idea, and essentially nobody believed it. And, and yet, just uh, something like uh, a couple of years after, after that, everybody accepted it. And I, I won't go into the arguments and stuff. What, what changed in 1960s, in the early 1960s, but Baker really loved this idea, and really, and so he revised this book after, after uh, two, after five years, and I've got a copy of that one checked out of the UCLA library. So this this is the original uh, edition of the 1920 version, I, and I, I've got a reprint edition at home of the 1950. But I I I, I mean I haven't been reading it. I. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, reasonably fluent in German, but it, it's, it's not that much fun to read it. <laughs> so, uh, Dinger was, was born in 1880, died already in 1930, so he only lived to be 50. He, uh, in 1918, he took a job as the chief scientist in charge of weather forecasting at the Humboldt Stern Garden which means stellar observatory. I, uh, I'm not sure why, why it was a stellar observatory in the city of Hamburg, except I guess maybe the, clies, the skies were reasonably clear for a while in Hamburg. And uh, so that was his first decent job where, where, with some uh, aspects of tenure associated with it. But then he got a professorship at Graz in, in Austria in 1922. He, but he's mainly, in, in his lifetime, he was mainly known for his research on atmospheric dynamics, and especially the polar atmosphere. And he already, as a young man, as a roughly 20-year-old, he, he joined Danish expeditions to explore the icy parts of Greenland. And he overwintered there on three occasions, two, I think, with the Danes, and then one where he organized the, the, uh, the intent of overwinter. And why, why do you do that? Well, because the winds are different in the winter. They, they set up their equipment and in, the, in the summer, but then they wanted to have 12-month records and not just three or four-month records. And uh, tragically, he died on the ice in Greenland, returning to the west coast after uh, using a dog sled, or he and a colleague using dog sleds, maybe two of them, taking supplies to the crew that was overwintering. And, and so he was on the way back to the, to the west coast, and then I don't know whether he was planning to go on back to Germany or not. But he didn't make it. Uh, speculation is that he died in a heart attack. But, he, but now I'm going to tell you some of the lesser known facts. For example, with his, with his brother Kurt, he spent 52 hours in a balloon gathering data on the upper uh, atmosphere, upper troposphere. And this 52 hours at the time eclipsed all previous long durations of balloon flights. 
So, so uh, he, he was a brave guy. I mean, he, he, he was doing interesting things there, too, in addition to spending uh, the winters on Greenland. And he, in 1920, he published two papers, and I, I decided I would uh, show you his publication list that, that's in one of the books I have. And there they are. Uh, Aufschwartz means impact, so the impact theory of, of Mont moon craters. And then the next one's on the same topic. And then it just so happens that the next one is the 1920 version of his uh, formation of continents and oceans book that I just showed you here. So uh, this thing that looks like a beautiful crater here, he produced. So he was an experimentalist too. But uh, but how he produced it is, is great. He, he discovered that he could get craters of the sort that he wanted to produce by using semen, dry powdered semen. And it had to be just the right thickness if he, in order to give him a central peak, which is commonly observed on the moon. And uh, how did he accelerate his projectile? Oh, the projectile was also made out of semen. And he, pre he accelerated it by putting it in a tablespoon and throwing it. <laughs> but but it's, a, it's really a very, very nice uh, resemblance to many lunar craters. Anyhow, he, he was fully convinced. But then looking, looking around to see, as I suspected, whether, whether most people actually still thought lunar craters were volcanic, I came across this paper by William Wallace Campbell and some of the uh, university historians or astronomers may know the name because he was the director of the Lick Observatory of the University of California for nearly 30 years. And for seven years, he was the president of the University of California, and he concluded that they were volcanic. Uh, one, that was uh, one year, well, it was the same year as these two great prayer papers were being published by the uh, And uh, he, he, has, uh, he has my mansion, my uh, respect, and uh, and uh, as it says down here, uh, it, uh, this statement there in German resonates with me because it uh, expresses ideas that are closely similar to, similar to my own philosophy of science. His father-in-law had written him a letter. His father-in-law was a distinguished scientist, a meteorologist, had written him a letter and said, you know, son-in-law, you, you should be paying attention. You're, you're going way out on a limb to argue for continental drift, and it, it may uh, it might harm you at some later time, and I, I mean, maybe it did, maybe that's why he was, got his position at Graz, rather than, uh, I don't know, Heidelberg, or, or a, a more famous German-speaking university. Anyhow, he wrote back to his father-in-law and said this, and, and on my somewhat loose translation says, if in this case, the new model, give, model gives an abundance of simplifications that makes sense of the evolution of the Earth. Why should we hesitate to throw the old viewpoint overboard? <laughs> so, uh, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, Dagner was uh, really a naturalist for all seasons.
us who saw uh, 15 years of hunting, searching, and acquiring and preserving uh, these very special items that, as you say, come to the street from outer space, but uh, fantastic. Yeah. And, and Jason is here, right? Jason is here. He's 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 so Arlene, I, I understand that you have the Haven near your right, and that has an impact on your life as a collector. Can you describe how? I also was a rock collector, probably as long as I can remember. So anytime there was ever a place where you could see rocks, I had to go look. And there's one particular place they had geodes, and they said, we have to look, let's go in. And there's one thing sitting on the counter, rolling a spin. In the middle, and it had the sketch pad on it, and I was just instantly intrigued. I said, What is it? And they said, It's a meteorite. And I couldn't imagine how a meteorite could have this beautiful sketch pad. And I bought it, and it was the beginning of the end of those pictures. I went home with that and two more pieces, and I Googled it for the rest of the history. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so, Caitlin, um, you're a graduate student and you're training to become a professional scientist, and you said you rights. Yes. Uh, which scientific question are you trying to address with me? Um, <coughs> is it working? Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, so what I am interested in addressing with meteorites rights is uh, it's sort of this observation that in our solar system we have stuff that's made up of a lot of rock. We also see stuff that has a lot of water and a lot of ice. But by the time it falls to Earth, um, it's come through into the warm part of the solar system where we live. And so all that we really have left is the rock part. But there's this huge part of our solar system full of water and full of ice that we just don't really have any samples of yet. So I'm interested in some meteorites that have been affected by water. And so we can learn a little bit more about the water and the processes that uh, have affected the rock and the water together by studying the traces of the water left over in the rocks. Um, Alan, and I want to uh, ask about the mineral rubenite. We are Alan Rubin, and the mineral was re recently named after you. Uh, what was the mineral found in the meteorite? Uh, yes, there's uh, two meteorites. There are currently two meteorites. One is called the Yende, which fell in 1969 in Mexico, and the other is Figurano, and I actually don't remember the maps from the mountains. I can do you wrong. Well, it's Italy, all right. And uh, these are carbon chondrites. Uh, Nick actually had one of these similar meteorites on display uh, a little earlier this evening. And there's, uh, in these kinds of meteorites, there are certain kinds of inclusions called refractory inclusions that are very rich in the elements calcium and aluminum and titanium. Uh, and these things form, these are the earliest solids that formed in the solar system, the oldest rocks in the solar system. And uh, a number of very unusual minerals are found in these, including one that was named after me. Uh, earlier this year, and it's one of the newest crops of meteorites, it's a calcium aluminum garnet, so that it makes me some high precious. <laughs> <laughs> I remind you that if you have questions, please write them down on index cards, and, and they're being collected. All right, very good. Uh, so, Alan, I know you, re you received a lot of requests for meteorite identifications. How many exactly do you see per day or per week, and where do these requests come from? I've gotten requests from all over the world, uh, from every continent except Antarctica. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I get, uh, well, maybe 10 or 15 requests every week, either from people calling me on the phone, sending me emails, sending me samples, or showing up unannounced. And uh, out of the several thousand of these messages that I've gotten over the years at UCLA, um, from the general public, maybe five or six that turned out to be real meteorites out of the many thousands of samples that we get. We call these rocks meteor wrongs <laughs> uh, because they're not right. And some of the people are very adamant that uh, these things are real samples because they intuit some features on They've done their homework and spent an hour on the internet. And so they are sure that I'm wrong when I uh, tell them the unfortunate rocks are not meteorites. Alright, so Caitlin, um, you talked about your research. Are there instruments at UCLA that enable your research? Yes, so actually, um, UCLA, like for me, was really one of the ideal places to do the very research. Um, because they have uh, not just great uh, instruments, but unique instruments, and really brand new things that no other university has. 
um, that allow us to make totally different kinds of measurements uh, of meteorites and with all other types, you know, gaseous samples, just solid samples, you know, stuff that you know you can't do uh, other places. So that was you know really why I decided to come here. Uh -huh. Edwards, why did you have her? <laughs> <laughs> so, Arlie, how many meteorites have you collected since you encountered that? 700. 700. Okay. And you decided to donate over 60 of those to the UCLA collection. Can you tell us what motivated you to do this? Well, I think the stars were lying that I had to move up. Because we moved here in California, and I didn't set to be one night. I think it's time to start thinking about putting a trust together. And you have to think about the reason why these things to go. So at that moment, I got an email on that list. It's a kind of a worldwide list of everybody, scientists, collectives, everybody. So I wanted it. And it was something from Alan Rubin. <laughs> and it's signed, Classical Chemistry, Robert Earth for Planetary Sciences, whatever. So everything that I was interested in was signed right there. And there's UCLA. I said, well, let's look up UCLA. And I was like, okay, let's start. And lo and behold, they were starting a museum. And I contacted him, and the rest is it. All right. And we're very grateful for your gift. Everybody, if you want to see the uh, Shiz collection, it's available in the Mirai Gallery. And it's open every day from 9 to 4? 9 to 4. 9 to 4. And About every weekday. Every weekday. And not open on Saturday. So it's a wonderful um, Peter, how many of you are hunting trips and traditions have you organized or participated in? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to a few, actually. <laughs> probably, I have to guess, probably. 
tax by 3 AD for Chrysler. And, and then you, it gets get into the nomenclature committee, and, and if you're lucky, you get an answer within a few weeks. If you're not lucky, it won't take long. So, so Peter, you're obviously a, an expert hunter of meteorites. What advice would you give to maybe a beginner meteorite hunter? For I think the most critical to me, I have no idea really what a meteorite looks like. And if you think about it, that's pretty foolish. You try not to, you know, one of the dry lakes, and I don't know what we imagine would be looking for on the right So the, the number one advice is find out what they look like. <laughs>
size. Okay. So we'll have to see if they can get it because I really need to see the detail. And once I did that, I printed it out and see how beautiful it was. And all of a sudden, it's so hard. And all different kinds of things, with sparkles, to every kind of brush you can think of, to digital enhancement, all kinds of things. And what medium do you use for, for your art? I have metal, I have glass, I have, I have a wine room, and a door. My door is a wooden satin pattern. The whole thing, that's glass, it's absolutely gorgeous. And that was a quite, quite a challenge for the person who had to do it. She, she had a good job like that. We had this world, so to speak. So. And you have jewelry? I have jewelry. I have blankets, I have pillows, I have clothes, I have scarves. <laughs> He may suspect what it is, but doesn't know for sure. He can't set the market value 
from what the meter rate is until he has it fully certified by uh, someone like a meter researcher like us here at UCLA. And so the way the system works is that a dealer will uh, give a sample to us uh, and we will characterize it. We get a sample free for our collection and we even charge him a fee for that. And uh, we categorize it, analyze it, uh, get a name for it, becomes official with a meter at nomenclature committee. And now he knows what kind it is, so he can set the price for it when he sells it, and the collectors have to pay the bill. Do you have a favorite uh, meteorite related memory that you want to share? Yeah, probably there's a lot of them. But I just find that my own meteorite was pretty special. My very first one uh -huh. was on the dry lake bed. And I never in a million years thought after I looked at it, this huge expanse that I would find a rock in the midst of all these other rocks. <laughs> so even fell that this was going to happen. What if about one hour into the hunt, I saw that the rest of the yellow brown little stone, it's only 12 grams. Yeah. And I picked it up, and no one called, I never seen it right. So that was pretty special. So for however many thousands you spend on the collection, there's no price I put on that little one. And now that's what I've been doing. I am you're more successful than I am. I fell three times and never found it. Uh, Peter, what are some of the most massive new you own and where are they located? The new you are just like. As I think Dr. Sassianis tend to tend to supply the atmosphere and entry much rather than the sun, so they tend to be larger. Uh, and I think the largest one we have is the Gideon, from a large shower of lines that was discovered in, 18, in the 1830s, I think, in Namibia. And there were, there were many large pieces, and this is a piece that's about 800, there's over 800 pounds. We fall, we never weight it, because it's hard to get it, and it's hard to move that kind of thing around. And the second largest would be an iron that came from Texas, that was found in the 1970s by a rancher in Texas. Now, recognized that one of the land wasn't, didn't belong where it was, and took it home. And then he lost it away, and his son took possession of it. He lost it away, the family decided to get rid of it. And we were back by dealer in, in San Diego, and we flew to San Antonio, and drove out to the whole country, beautiful country, and picked up this, it's about just over 300 pounds, and that's in the gallery, too, it's all kind of wood. And we did that, and at the beginning, uh, what's it called? One of, the, one of our goals. Oh, 
Bible with our soul. And I don't know how to get out of here. I just pushed out of the land into the land of the whole land. And I don't know how to get out of here. I mean, it's very difficult. It's not easy. <laughs>
we think that it's totally negligible to not have that disappear that's lost by uh, erosion from the universe. Did the meteorites themselves get eroded? Oh, sure. They get terribly eroded. Uh, uh, the stony meteorites lose probably, if they remain as a single piece, they typically lose perhaps half of their mass on the way through. But many stony meteorites break up into uh, many different pieces, and then each of those pieces may end up losing half its mass. So uh, often you, you can use cosmic ray to produce new tides, so isotopes, to estimate where a meteorite was in the original mass that was outside the Earth's atmosphere. And, and when you do that, you always come up with much bigger objects than we end up in our museum. So maybe we get 50 kilograms in a museum and we estimate that uh, 500 or 1,000 kilograms actually hit the top of the mass. Right. And still on the topic of Wagner's meteorite, is there an asteroid that is thought to be the source of it? Whether or not that's the case, please comment on the process needed to produce an iron meteor. Hmm. Uh, the answer is that we essentially uh, don't know the source of any meteorites except a, a few grains collected by a Japanese spacecraft, uh, like two milligrams or so. All the, everything else is speculation. We we can do we can look at the reflection spectrum of asteroids, and this gives us some clues about what they are going to produce. For example, that's probably an ordinary contract, but there's no way to go from that reflection spectrum to the meteorite collection and say, ah, oh, this, it must be this meteorite that came from that asteroid. It's just, it's just not possible. And there, there is more to the collection, to the question, or how, how do you produce an iron meteorite? <clears throat> oh, yeah. So how do you produce an iron meteorite? There's two ways. First, you've got, to, you've got to melt the, the starting material. The starting material is generally assumed to be a chondrite. And the chondrites are the primitive meteorites. They're, they're the true building blocks of the planet. And they, they have, all the chondrites have a little bit of metal in them. Some have quite a bit of metal, up to say 20, 20 or even greater than 20% metal. So if you melt a chondrite that has appreciable metal in it, they you melt the whole thing. The metal and the silicates don't dissolve in each other. They're, the word is immiscible. They're immiscible, and so they separate. And if you have the whole asteroid melted, then the metal goes down and forms a core. Because the, its density is around 7 or 8 times the density of water, and the silicates have a density of around 3 times the density of water. So just buoyancy causes the metal to sink and causes the molten silicates to rise. But there are a number of meteorites, maybe uh, of iron meteorites, maybe 30% uh, that we now think were melded in, in a sort of similar way to what I said, but melded by a single impact, and the melt formed very near the surface of the asteroid. And it started, this metal was also dense, it started down but it started down through cold silicates. And as it passed through the cold silicates, it kept giving some of its heat to the cold silicates, and it never made it to the core. And, and so uh, the, the Canyon Diablo, our, our, the meteorite you see when you walk into our gallery, is one of those. We think it, never, it was never part of the core. It was part of a big body of metallic melt that, that chilled as it started to flow down through cracks and crevices in a rubble pile asteroid. It's a question about ownership. Uh, who owns a meteorite that is found? Is it the finder? Is Why don't we ask you that question? Oh, right. <laughs> is it the owner of the property where it's found? Is it the government of the country where it's found? It's, 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 the, it's the owner of the property by and large. Uh, and so if it's government land, it belongs to the government. If it's private land, it belongs to the private landowner. Which is why it's very important when you go hunting, if you go hunting, to get permission, uh, work out some kind of deal if it's private land. If it's, if it's government land, there are restrictions on how much you can collect in the way of mineral matter from 
uh, for various national parks, for example, you're not allowed to unless you get permission. Uh, and then, then you are, then, then it's possible to get permission to collect material from national parks. Uh, other countries have rules, uh, probably different rules, and some of them have strict export rules. Australia, to get a significant, or any media right now, you have to go to the Cultural Heritage Commission and document what you're, what you're trying to export and, and prove that it's not something that they need for their, for their collections. Uh, we, we bought an iron from them about dueling iron that was, uh, that had been, would probably not have been released except that the largest specimen had been found. And originally there were three or four specimens and the largest specimens were found. So this one was released, but it took about two years, two years of paperwork to get the thing approved. Uh, in some countries, it's, it's you know, the rules are that you're not allowed to export, but uh, the rules are often broken. It's, it's hard to police that kind of thing. Uh, but, but even in places like Australia and Canada, where it's difficult to get specimens out, we can still trade with them and still get specimens for research without any problem. For research, yeah. Ali, what's your favorite meteorite type? Probably, I'd have to say, Ash Byron. <coughs> that, was, that was how I started my collection. All different types of Ash Byron. Mm -hmm. And then eventually that led to Palisades. Towards the end, I discovered Conrad to be a And then that took on the whole direction. Some meteor, uh, you know, I remember sort of my, the first meteorite that I ever looked at. I didn't start, I didn't know anything about meteorites until part of the way through my undergraduate degree. You know, I always liked space, but, you know, I, I guess I'd heard of a meteorite because I knew about the dinosaurs. Um, but never really realized that that was a way you could, that people studied space. And then I got to um, uh, the institution where I did my undergraduate. It also had a lot of meteorite researchers, like UCLA. And so the first thing that, you know, we sort of put under the microscope was, I think it was like a, like the first thing I looked at was like a, a type of meteorite we call an L3. So it has like these really nice, you know, really nice round condyles. They have this mineral in them called olivine and it looks rainbow under a certain type of microscope. So I, I'm like looking down this microscope and I'm like, wow. So, you know, that, that was just a kind of a really special memory. When I was moving out here, I looked at my old notes from this class. Uh, and from that first, you know, microscope lab session that I had, just like my, my first couple of thoughts about meteorites, it was cool to go back and do that. And what's your favorite individual meteorite? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I, you know, I... Yeah, I, th I guess the meteorite that's sort of uh, the gift that keeps on giving is the meteorite on your day, you know. It's, you know, we, it was sort of a lucky fall, you know, we saw it fall, we picked up a bunch of pieces of it, and, and it's the sort of interesting and kind of rare type of meteorite. Um, it's like, it's been most, it's been a lot of my foam backgrounds because it's also very beautiful when you sort of cut it in half. It's got all these different types of things inside of it. And, they're all really interesting. People study every single different particle inside of you know, inside of this object. Uh, which is, you know, it's supposed to be one of the best studied meteorites in the world. Uh, so you know, you don't use it for everything, but you know, it's been a big gift for meteorite researchers. Yeah. All right. Yeah. How about you, Ali? Favorite meteorite, individual meteorite, and why? Sorry. Absolutely, the best is my initial A, a perfect <laughs> sculptural individual letter A. Yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, is the origin of the lunar craters still in doubt, volcanic or impact? They're almost. Uh, let me turn on my mic. Uh, they're certainly almost all uh, impact, but there uh, there are a few spots on the moon where there are pits and sort of black something or another, 
spenders or so around the pits, and they they are probably volcanic, and and they uh, so may, maybe a hundredth of a percent or so of the craters on the moon. All right. Alan, what is the origin of the iron flakes in complex? That's an interesting question. Uh, when, if you look at some of these chondrites, we see that they're essentially mixtures of metal and silicate. So back very early in solar system history, when the, uh, there was an object, well, the big cloud of gas and dust in which the solar system formed called the solar nebula, uh, had this material in it. Uh, it had some pre-solar grains that were in it that were silicate. Some may have been uh, metal, some may have been uh, amorphous material, essentially glass. And uh, in certain areas near the general model would be that in certain areas near the sun, temperatures are very hot, uh, and then some of the minerals condensed. Uh, the metal would condense at one temperature, silicate at another temperature, and uh, we would have these metal and silicate uh, materials, and they, uh, as the grains sort of created to one another, they would mix together to form sort of these uh, dust agglomerates, sometimes called dust balls, although they're not necessarily round, um, and they would have these materials together before they were uh, melted or sintered or uh, form themselves into uh, larger rocks. So this would be the, essentially the origin of the uh, basic materials from which the uh, chondrites, the most primitive meteorites, arose. Right. And again, if you want to see samples of these, uh, the meteorite gallery is open every weekday, nine to four. Uh, is it going to be open later today? If some of you are, we, uh, Alan, and uh, well, let's say Alan is going to open it right now when we leave. <laughs> And I will be there, and maybe both of us will be there for a while, if if some of you want to show up. But uh, we'll we'll have it open for if if there's enough interest for half an hour. And feel free also to continue the conversation with our panelists. Um, and I want to thank you.